Yeah, hi everyone here and uh, watching remotely. Um, when I submitted this proposal, um, it was called GPT-3, incorporating GPT-3, but um, since then there have been quite a few other language mo large language models, so um, I took the liberty to uh, rename the talk uh, to make it more general because everything I'm going to be talking about um, will also hopefully translate to other models and the experiments we did, those were done with uh, GPT-3. So, um, yeah, just to get started, um, no? is this working? Sorry. Oh, hmm. sorry. Um. Ah, here, okay, it was just slow. Okay, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm Enos, some of you might know me from um, my work on Spacey, um, our company Explosion. Uh, develops the library and we have been since 2015, which is quite a long time ago. Spacey is an open source library for natural language processing in Python. And um, yeah, it's been very popular, um, downloaded a lot. And the mi its mission has always been to provide components and a library for doing industrial strength um, NLP. So for production workflows, focusing on speed, focusing on ease of use, um, and um, also combining um, cutting edge machine learning techniques with more classic raw based approaches and building pipelines for different use cases and especially focusing on information extraction which is a thing in pretty much all industries. Everyone has text, we have more text than anyone can possibly read. We want to find out more about this text that goes beyond just searching for keywords and that's really what Spacey um, specializes in. And um, as soon as you start working um, with NLP and um, you know, you're uh, more serious about um, what you're doing, you pretty much always want data. You need data to train your models, you need data to evaluate your models, and that's how our first um, commercial product, Prodigy, was born, which is an, an annotation tool for creating training data and evaluation data for machine learning models. And it's really designed as a developer tool um, it comes with a command line interface, with a Python library, and with a UI. So you can start as a data scientist, as a developer, spinning up a task, creating some data yourself, running your experiments, and then scale it up um, with more annotators for all kinds of different tasks, from name entity recognition, text classification, um, image, image um, annotation, classification, audio, video, um, pretty much anything you can render in a browser you can annotate and um, really the focus on a developer tool, which was um, kind of new and unusual at the time, was because we really saw that you need, to be, you need to develop your data. Data is not static, just the same way code is not static. So it really needs to be a part of your developer workflow instead of just something you outsource um, and get your data back. So that's, um, that's what we're doing and we're currently working on a cloud version of Prodigy that lets you um, work collaboratively on your data without compromising on the data privacy and scriptability. So you can run your own cluster, don't need to send any of your data into the cloud um, or to us. And um, yeah, there'll be an announcement soon. We're pretty much almost ready uh, to get it out. It's been in the works for a long time. So that's all really exciting. And yeah, like um, probably many, many of you, we've um, also been uh, very excitedly following the new developments in large language models, um, because especially if you're doing NLP, one problem has always been how to get more knowledge about the world and the language into your model. Like back in the day, you really had to train your model entirely from scratch. You needed tons of data and um, really teach it everything from the thing you're trying to um, learn and trying to extract to um, how does English work and what are concepts that are mentioned. And that was very um, tedious. And then came word vectors, that was kind of nice. Then um, came better embeddings, transformers, all of this um, really made a difference. And now we're um, really at a point where we can see that these larger and larger models trained on more and more data, um, trying to predict the next word or words um, really work extremely well and not only um, encode specific information, but really encode a lot about um, our, the language and the world, which is what makes them so great. So we thought, hey, there must be, there, there, there are so many interesting um, and exciting ways you can incorporate them 
into um, an NLP workflow, and um, that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So, um, first, what are practical NLP workflows? One thing that's still that's always been very popular and still is one of the main um, ways people work with machine learning is supervised learning and that's not necessarily that's not um, a disadvantage or um, a limit it's actually kind of a feature because if you're doing supervised learning you'll be able, you can create examples and tell the computer exactly what you want it to do based on examples that's super powerful because often if you are actually if you have a problem you want to solve you kind of know what you want the computer to do, and you just need a good way to tell it. So supervised learning is really great in that respect, because you can say, here, here's what I want out, try to generalize and um, learn representations that give me that. So um, that's very powerful, but of course, um, it means you need uh, good data and enough data. Not necessarily big, big data and millions of examples or billions or whatever, but you need very good representative data, you need to anticipate what will go in and you need to create that and you need to constantly keep that up to date. So that's, um, that's one of the parts um, that's tricky, but that's also something um, that uh, large language models can potentially help with. And now you might be looking at this and think like, well, we, we hear so much about uh, these models um, won't all of this supervised learning or training your own models and creating these things, won't that all be obsolete? Uh, can't we just train bigger and bigger models and run them and then just have ChatGPT do everything from start to finish? And the answer is maybe for a lot of use cases, but there's still, um, especially in practical real world applications, there are still cases where you really want to use the language model as a tool and not as um, the entire system. And um, yeah, that, that's um, especially relevant if you have cases where business logic comes in, um, which is you know, your own specific resources, for example, your own um, yeah, logic that only applies to you. So um, one of these cases is, there, um, or one of these scenarios is, um, are scenarios where specific is just better. The most valuable use cases or the most value is normally in the things that are really, really specific to a use case and not general purpose and don't generalize well across other things. And um, if you have a large language model, the, the reason it's so great is that it was trained on so much data that it can give you the most likely best answer and best um, text and best analysis out at the end, which is great. But if what you're interested in is kind of the opposite, <laughs> then, um, yeah, that, that's, that it can still only be a part of your um, entire pipeline or entire system, and you always want to inject something that makes it really specific um, to you. Um, the other uh, scenario is faster is better. Um, while um, computers are getting faster, um, it will be less and less of a problem to run larger and larger models, even maybe on a laptop or in the cloud. Uh, there are still a lot of scenarios where you really need an answer and need the full answer in split seconds. And that's d very difficult if your model is large. And even as computers are getting faster and models are getting larger, there will always be use cases where you want something smaller inste instead of a model that can do maybe a lot of things that you're not even interested in. Um, so or you want to have your model run on um, a phone or a tiny embedded device or maybe in the future on a ring I recently <laughs> bought like one of these, these smart rings. Who knows? Maybe that's the future. Maybe you can run an LLM on these. But for that, you want to, um, you know, do some custom work to make it faster and um, smaller, and only focus on what you want. Next, data privacy. It's something I mentioned earlier. Um, it's something that's very important for us for our tools. There's so many industries where, um, even nowadays, people work on entirely air gap machines. Nothing can get, uh, no internet, nothing can come in or go out. And um, people are you know, discussing GDPR, how does that interact with um, models trained on everything on the internet? Um, and I think that's also a very important conversation and already we see that in our, in our customers, our user base. People do not want to send their text to someone else's API. And I think in a lot of use cases, they also shouldn't. I mean, patient records, healthcare, um, that stuff should not 
go out into the world. And that stuff should also not feed back into language models um, because uh, potentially there's a lot that these models can leak. So there is, there is definitely work on differential privacy and training on data without actually using the data. And that's all very interesting research, but um, from a pragmatic standpoint, I think for a lot of companies, it's still um, much better, much more effective and efficient to just do these things in-house, which means training their own models on their data that run in a specific environment and not sending anything, um, especially not at runtime, to um, a third-party provider. So that's also where an LLM can come in, um, for example, during the training phase or during the creation phase, but not um, at runtime. And finally, um, there are also a lot of cases where better is just better. And what we, if we're looking at ChatGPT, that does a lot to raise the floor, and that's like super cool. But there are many cases where actually what's really important is the ceiling. And um, a model that's like surprisingly crazy good, given that it's not trained on something specific, is often not good enough than some <laughs> compared to something that's trained for a specific purpose. And to, like, there's, some, there's some examples where, yeah, maybe good enough is good enough. And then there are cases like fraud detection, for example, where there's, there's never a ceiling. You can always be better. And, and you can always um, add, uh, you know, go one step further. And, Again, in these cases, um, you can um, incorporate these models, but there's always a lot of custom work you want to be doing to get more out of them. Um, so um, if you're looking at uh, you know, building something with a large language model in a loop and maybe use it to do stuff um, automatically for you um, instead of creating training data, there are some problems um, you, especially when it comes to information extraction um, that, or if you want to use the data to maybe train a smaller downstream model uh, that you have to be aware of and um, work around. And one of them is prompt engineering, which is yeah, pretty hot uh, topic at the moment. Um, but basically you have this whole other variable now, which is the prompt that you feed into the model. There's a lot of research around how to best phrase your prompt, what to best um, do. I think it also, um, it's actually kind of non-trivial. I think it helps a lot to know how these models work, to actually also know a bit about language, to really come up with the best possible way to prompt your model. But it means that's something you have to try out, um, you have to test. There's no one best answer. It's a lot of trial and error. And if your prompt changes, that also means the output changes. So. Um, in the output, it's easy to get inconsistent results. That's maybe also something you've seen if you've played um, with the models. It's not such a big deal if you are the human consuming and reading it, but if you want a machine to consume the output and read it, that actually requires a lot more um, work. So you might have the, a really good response um, right there, but it's unstructured again. So now you're kind of back at square one where you have to, for example, use NLP. <laughs> in order to A, um, create that prompt, and then B, turn that prompt into something that you can, create, you can compute with. And the response might still be better than anything else that um, you, know, you could easily train yourself, but you need to turn it into something that a computer can work with. So these are the main um, problems, and that's also something we've seen in our experiments and um, yeah, try to find good solutions for, because if we solve these, then um, yeah, we can really um, have a much faster and much more efficient workflow for creating custom models. And um, so, yeah, one um, important um, aspect is definitely if we are working with large language models as a component, um, as a tool in order to uh, better create data, for example, the process needs to be iterative. We need to be able to very quickly try things out. Um, because we have the prompt, change the prompt slightly, the result changes. Uh, need to change the way we're passing the result, try a different prompt, and so on. Try out, how, how about we let the large language model return JSON? Can that work? Um, sometimes works well, sometimes doesn't. Um, maybe we can ask it to give us a list. Maybe we can ask it to format things. Um, all of these things really depend on the use case and on the prompt. Um, so we basically needed a workflow that made us like able to do this really quickly and efficiently 
um, and also kind of store the intermediate state of like, okay, here's the code um, for the prompt and the parsing. Um, so we kind of have a record of that. And second, evaluation um, is um, very important. If not, I, I'm not sure I would say more important. It's always important, but um, it's something that's often ignored. But um, it's one thing to try out things yourself and play around with what the model gives you, but you need a really, really stable um, evaluation. You need data. You still need to create examples where you know the answer so you can check it against um, what you get from that model. And actually, at the moment, what makes it sort of even more important is if you're consuming it from an API, especially from a third-party provider, OpenAI, Cohere, um, these models can just change, and they do change, and often maybe in, in good ways, if there's a bug found, if there's an issue, um, a new version is deployed, and so you can never really rely on um, getting back um, the same um, result. Similarly, um, you might not even be getting back the exact same answer for the same prompt every time, so um, you really want to have a stable representative evaluation that you can run every day constantly to make sure that um, you're really getting what you're expecting. And um, so that's also something, yeah, we, we needed to do. We needed to have um, a fast, efficient way to create that evaluation data, and we need to be able to run that. And uh, finally, um, we've also seen that in a, in a lot of real-world use cases, um, the goal, um, it doesn't make much sense to set the goal as replacing any task-specific models and just having this one um, LLM magically do everything. There's so many um, uh, avenues and so many, so many factors where you just want to inject something custom that um, the most promising path at the moment is you want to use them to improve task-specific models and get to um, something that does exactly what you want much quicker than before rather than trying to get something bigger that um, happens to be able to do quite decent at what you want on top of a lot of other things. Um, and that's also, yeah, that's, we think in our experiments, we've seen that that's really where um, the models um, are strongest. And also that's something you see at the moment in the literature, there have been several papers um, comparing the result of um, say a GPT model to um, a more task, um, a more task specific model on benchmark data sets. And we do see that um, of course, if you train something for a specific purpose, the results are still significantly better, and that's not uh, surprising. That's, um, that makes um, a lot of sense. Um, so that's also what I'm going to be focusing on here, because I think that's also the most exciting part, and it's really the part where um, you, we want to think further than just text generation as the system. I think once you um, really look at it and think past the most obvious, I think there are a lot of really... Um, exciting and interesting um, use cases to solve real-world problems. And um, yeah, so what we ended up building is scriptable workflows. Um, we need a human in the loop, um, even if what you're doing is something that can be done end-to-end -end by just the language model and you're creating something, um, you still need evaluation data. You need at some point to come in and say, here are examples I know the answer to. And that won't go away. And you need a way to inject your business logic, um, which could be looking things up in a database or um, checking, um, checking things where there is a correct answer and um, where you don't just want to rely on the model potentially hallucinating um, a correct fa a fact, which um, is also something we've seen um, happen. So um, here's a quick diagram of um, our um, experiments and our um, workflows. Um, in the corner, you can see the GitHub repo. These are all, um, while Prodigy is a commercial tool, the recipes and workflows are all open source. Um, you can look at um, the code. You can also look at, look at some videos um, and see how it works in practice. And I'll also walk you through some visual examples. But the idea is we start with a prompt um, and with a task, for example, Here's a text from a recipe, um, as in, um, you know, for, here, here's how to cook something. We've, we can scrape that from Reddit, and we want to extract ingredients and um, equipment. And we can have an example of that, of the tech input text. We can give, in the, as part of the prompt, we can say, here's how, you, how we want you to do it. List 
all the, all the ingredients and list all the equipment, and then we query um, a large language model. For example, here, GPT-3.5, um, that's what we use, but now um, there's also GPT-4 available, there's uh, chat GPT, so there are a lot of um, different options, and then what we get back is the zero shot or few shot response, hopefully in a format that we can pass and that matches the um, example in the prompt. And then in Prodigy, we can load that in, view it visually, and curate data that we want for our task specific model. So we can uh, correct mistakes, um, correct inconsistencies, and we can um, skip examples that um, we don't think are a good fit. And if it's all correct, we can just um, save it and very quickly end up at a really good data set um, and also a data set using, um, uh, yeah, maybe things, yeah, things we hadn't thought of before. So that's, um, that's the workflow. And to give you an idea roughly of how that looks under the hood, this is kind of uh, more of a pseudocode example because of course, if you're querying an API, there's like a bunch of uh, boilerplate that's like, you know, that I don't want to put on my slide, but the general idea is this. So Prodigy is fully scriptable. So you write your workflow as part, as a Python function. So the function loads your data, puts together your stream, and then returns um, the component. So it returns uh, the name of the data set to save the annotations to a view ID, which is the interface to use, so plain text, named entities, image, audio, all of these have like their own JSON format um, of how you feed in the data. You give it a stream of examples that you wanna view and you wanna annotate, and you can give it an up optional update callback that's called when you receive answers back. So what we can do here in our case is in the, when you start up the recipe on the command line, we query the large language model and pass the response. So we load in some of our um, Reddit examples um, uh, or any text really. Um, we ask the model, um, add the annotations, pass them out from the text and send it forward. And um, if we get um, examples back, we can also use them to tune the prompt if needed. So if there are, if we see problems, if there is something um, that we kind of ideally want the, the model to adjust to, we can send it back, include it in the prompt, um, and then in the future, we'll hopefully get better examples, or worse. That's why, you know, it's iterative, um, because you're changing the prompt, uh, it might tank the whole thing, so there's a lot of trial and error um, to use. So um, here's one example, I hope you can read this. Um, this is how it looks like, uh, how, how it looks in the UI, um, so we can, see here because it's you know, the, it's an iterative process. You really want to be able to see what the prompt was, what the response was in case something goes wrong until you've really found something that you can scale up. So we can see here, um, it's actually like really, it was really um, uh, rewarding and exciting to try this out because the model is pretty good, especially here we've chosen a topic that um, we know the model has probably, um, the language model has probably seen a lot of. Um, these are all, food concepts, um, that's pretty common. So um, it's doing uh, surprisingly well, and um, the approach here is we give it a text and um, we're asking it to extract um, comma-separated uh, lists of strings. That's what, that works quite well. Um, sometimes, yeah, we've tried out different approaches. Um, there are um, scenarios where it might work to ask it um, to give you JSON that you can pass although it might take some iterations to see it's valid JSON, um, feels a bit hacky. Here, one problem you might have that you can't rely on it to always give you um, uh, every instance. So there's still some logic, um, as in, you know, kind of basic, actually basic NLP, you then have to apply back in order to um, really select uh, these entities, but it works. So this was very, um, this was very satisfying. But of course, there are also, um, cases where it gets it wrong. It's quite subtle. Um, here's the mistake. Uh, the pans um, are missing in the, um, uh, in the output. So this is just an example of, well, model just got it wrong. It's, it's not perfectly consistent, um, just like humans are not perfectly consistent. Um, and, but what we can do in the UI is we can manually correct it, remove the incorrect highlight, um, add a corrected um, version that's very quick. 
just highlighted, set and um, uh, still, even if the model gets, um, you know, 10% wrong, that's still 90% um, less work for you as the human. And at the same time, it also gives you more insights into what's there, um, how the prompts work, um, how the responses work, and build up a better mental model. Because the truth is, we're still at a point where we don't actually know so much about how um, yeah, what, what really happens under the hood and what the best way is to get the best answer. Um, so this is a good way to also try things out. And um, what we've also built in, um, which was pretty cool, is um, you can flag an example that's like a built-in feature in Prodigy, and we're using that to add um, the correct answer to the prompt, to tune the prompt. So if we are in a scenario where we see, oh, the model gets a lot wrong, or this specific example is quite important and um, it, it can't get it right, then we can add it and hopefully um, get better uh, responses later on. So um, the same works for um, a, a text classification as well. So that's another thing we tried out. Um, uh, we give it a text and um, a label and we ask um, the uh, model to basically um, uh, um, yeah, say whether we should accept this for the category or reject it. And so, and the ni very nice thing here is we can ask it to generate and display a reason. So that's, that can be part of the prompt. So um, the prompt asks, is this text a recipe? And if yes, why? If not, why? And for a lot of these things, it can actually do that um, uh, surprisingly well. So, um, because also a lot of these examples are quite clear. That's that's really where the model is very strong at that sort of question answering task, and we can take um, advantage of that. And even if it's wrong, this gives you at least some insight into um, how that prediction came about, whether it's uh, yeah whether it's correct or not. And the same also works for. Um, multiple answers, so that's also something, that's just a different interface. In Prodigy, um, we give it a multi-select, pre-select um, what we get from the large language model. And um, yeah, here it chooses, out of the three, it selects uh, the category feedback because the text is providing an opinion about the use of cream cheese in mashed potatoes. So um, it, does, um, uh, it does get it, and um, yeah, that's, um, we're still trying out different different workflows. So um, these are just some of the examples that were very promising. Um, but um, oh yeah, but we can we can definitely see this working well in a lot of other scenarios too. And I'll also uh, show um, or um, give a quick overview of some other things we're working on at the moment um, along uh, similar lines. And um, I think one thing uh, we generally see when working with NLP. Um, in a real world scenario is that a lot of the um, uh, things we're trying to find out, they don't ma necessarily map neatly to an end-to-end -end prediction problem. So um, the, a lot of the work is in taking a business problem that you have, like populate my database and relate these two things to each other and then do some maths to something, to a pipeline and to components that you can train, write, code, whatever. And um, yeah, and, the thing, and um, while a lot of examples of having a model directly predict the output um, are very cool, it doesn't always map neatly and most effectively to a real world problem. So here's an example, I've actually used that in several of my talks because it's really actually quite close to what a lot of people are trying to do even though in um, different scenarios. So here we want to build a system that takes news um, announcements of company sales and extracts um, a nice JSON representation of all the info in it. And this is actually something that nowadays you could try and get a large language model to predict, um, like um, verbatim the JSON. And I think it could do that in some cases, but, um, and that's very, um, and there's a lot of research around this, and that's very exciting, but it's also um, not very modular, and it's quite risky if you're actually um, using this in your system because you really have to rely on it to output you exactly this and if something changes, um, you have a problem. So the way this is often done in 
you know, a, a practical setting or the way I would maybe um, recommend someone solve this problem is first you want to start you start out by deciding whether um, that system w whether that text is about a company sale in the first place because you'll get a lot of noise no matter how good your scraping is you'll always end up with noise so that's the first one is it even about that if not you discard that that's probably quite easy to do these days if you have some data text classification company sale yes or no um, that probably gets you uh, quite far next you want to get um, the company names out so you want to you want to find out which companies um, are uh, mentioned in the text and um, the actual text they're mentioned in and then you actually want to relate these companies to an entry in a knowledge base you want to relate Microsoft to the entity Microsoft, whether on, it's on Wikidata or some other resource you might have internally. Um, that's uh, typically referred to as entity linking. Um, for company names like this, it's quite easy. That's all public info. But often, if you're yeah, working on something internally in a company, you might have your own knowledge base of products and uh, want to link mentions to those products. And that always needs custom work. But that's something you can train um, if you have uh, some data and some examples. And finally, stock tickers. There's still, yeah, your um, large language model could probably do that. Um, it might also hallucinate you a stock ticker. So that's a fact. That's something that doesn't even need machine learning. Um, you can look that up online and that will be correct and that will be fast. And that's just a component you want to add on top. Um, you don't want this to be part of your whole process. Um, and finally, price, you can detect the price, you can convert it to, and uh, you want to convert it to an amount that you can do maths with. That's also something machine learning can do, but actually I think that Python libraries that can do it for you much more effectively. Um, you could, that you can test, um, there's no need uh, to potentially introduce mistakes this way. Parsing a number is kind of solved and um, I'm not sure any complex model can beat um, a Python library um, that you can just download on PyPy. So as you can see here, there are two um, parts of it that where I think um, even right now, a large language model can absolutely help with and be integrated as a tool, which is the text classification step. I'm pretty sure you get really good accuracy out of the box. Um, uh, and if you cur curate this, you can very, very quickly get to a data set that's good, comprehensive, representative, to train that component and even um, some old school text classification methods, they're still, if you look at the literature, some um, even old, uh, even you know, a bag of words model in some cases can uh, really outperform your fancy uh, large transformer model. Um, there, there's like a lot, a lot of low hanging fruit there that you can take advantage of. Entity recognition the same, um, extracting company names, that's something you can bootstrap very quickly with a language model and then you have a base system you can use that you can add your business logic on top of and you have a robust pipeline that you can test. Um, and yeah, I think I'm, very, I'm definitely very excited to keep um, experimenting with this because I think this will make a lot, of, a lot of, in a lot of use cases, the first steps especially were the bottleneck. And I think um, we, can, yeah, we can improve this and um, make it a lot easier to solve these kind of custom problems. And so yeah, in summary, here's the uh, GitHub URL again if you want to check out these workflows. Large language models, they're a great tool for creating better data faster and iteratively. Iteration, incredibly important. You always need task-specific data. Um, there's no way around that. It's a feature, not a bug. It's good. You can tell a system what to do and you need to evaluate your system. You'll always need to have the answers for at least some of your data. That's just how it is, and um, evaluation is good and important. You, n nobody need, yes, you can definitely you can end up at a 99% accuracy if your evaluation is shit. That's not what you want. You want a system that's useful, so you want a good evaluation. And yeah, there are many applications in the future that we don't even know about yet. And um, yeah, I definitely encourage everyone to yeah. If you think once you think past just hey, here's an input window and it generates text, there's a whole other world opening up. Um, of using a large language model as a tool. And some of the stuff we're working on are um, data structures for result parsing. For example, in Spacey, we have a lot of that already. So 
um, you know, we want to, if you take this unstructured response, pass it into something useful that you can um, compute with, that's very cool. Um, workflows for robust evaluation, evaluating prompts, comparing prompts, A-B testing prompts, that's all stuff um, that's very relevant, um, interactively testing them, and um, also open source models. There's a lot of um, cool work happening, um, and I think it'd be, become more and more feasible to run these models yourself locally, and that's something we're looking at. And of course, yeah, shout out to our team at Explosion. This is the work I'm presenting is not just my work. Um, that was definitely a team effort. Um, we've had a lot of people working and experimenting on this. And um, yeah, if you're interested in more um, real world um, applications of our stack, NLP, um, I also recommend checking out my colleague Victoria's talk tomorrow at two-ish. Uh, she'll be talking about building um, a custom front page for the internet to deal with information overload, which is probably something we can all relate to. Um, so yeah, I recommend checking that out. Thanks. Really, I now cannot stop myself from thinking of having a long, a long <laughs> oh my God, large language model on a smart ring. Is it really like our future? I don't know, but it's so interesting. And maybe replacing a couple of customly written Python function by a language model is like our next, yeah. next also, nearest actually, future. Actually, one thing I haven't even mentioned here because it didn't fit in is, of course, code, um, writing code will be much easier. There are a lot of models that can help with that. And I was very excited. One thing we tried out is, I think ChatGPT, we asked it to write spacey code. And wow. we've really put a lot of work into keeping the library backwards compatible, not breaking shit all the time, um, having you know, the same syntax. And it can do things like write patterns for spacey's rule-based matcher, which is kind of like regex um, taken to the next level. So you can describe tokens, words, and their attributes. And it can do that quite well. Also, there could be, uh, could be use cases where you ask it to generate you a rule that does reliably what you want. So there, there's a lot of cool Cool, stuff. and then just commit it to your GitHub so <laughs> everything yeah, works. Yeah, test it. Like it it's, I was very cool. excited to see that, like, oh, it can write. It can write that code. sounds just awesome. <laughs> yeah. So less work for us developers sounds very, very nice. Do you guys have any questions? We still have time. So let me pass the mic for you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I was wondering, when you say that when you have a bad example, you add it to the prompt, mm -hmm. it means that on top of the prompt, you put that exact example solved. Like, for instance, this is an example, and then you yeah, add your request. Here's, here's the, the question, here's the text, here's the answer. Um, and yeah. then I want something like yeah, this, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly, yeah. Ah, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah and then if, if there's several, let's say, bad examples, probably it will, you can reach the case where the prompt limit is uh, yeah. I mean, I think that that's that's an issue where you can that, that's something where the iterative <laughs> okay. you have to try things out. Okay. I don't. I'd, I'd have to ch also check the code how exactly we do it, but um, that's one. Um, it is quite interesting to see the larger uh, context and mm -hmm. um, prompts uh, being available in GPT four. I think yeah. So that's also something you want to play around with. Like imagine you could give it annotation guidelines because that is something you also have mm -hmm. to write anyways. You have. You need annotations that mm -hmm. are perfect and consistent, and mm -hmm. for your evaluation at least. Um, and so you might write a page explaining exactly how you want stuff annotated and how you want ambiguities resolved. Um, stuff like, mm -hmm. should doctor be part of the name? Is, uh, like there's, there's, there's a lot of, um, actually if you're interested in this, we have a blog post um, in collaboration with The Guardian. They did like some really cool NLP work and they also, um, publish their annotation guidelines because it's also it's journalists thinking about language. There's a lot of edge cases, even something as sim simple as quotes. Huge kind of everything is a is a can of worms. So you write these, and maybe we can feed those guidelines to the model as the prompt, and get good results back. That could be um, that could be quite exciting, but we'll have to see. That's it's like all very new. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Any more questions? Uh, oh, I believe you was first, right? And while, while I'm going, I just remind that we are still reading slido.com, and if you are online, we can ask your questions, so type it down. 
Thank you for the presentation. Um, so to my knowledge, uh, the terms of use of many LLMs actually prevent you from using their output to build new models. Whoever reads those, uh, well, yeah. I'm not. So the question is, does it somehow not apply here, or do you have a special deal at space? I mean, it's it, this is a legal question that has like no uh, precedent. Also, I'm I'm not sure if what they actually mean is the output, as in the generated text. I think that's I think that's mostly what they probably try to prevent because that really starts this avalanche of like text just being used, um, and here we're just asking it to create to reply with structure about text we already have. So I'm not sure, like this is, this is definitely interesting. Um, I mean, there's also the general copyright issue in general of like the model and can you even use this in the first place? I don't know, I do think if you have open source models, I think the terms um, will be different. I think, yeah, with the commercial models, sure, there's like, like with many SaaS tools, um, there's an incentive of the provider to cut out, um, uh, oh yeah, to, to make people depe more dependent on the service and cut that out. I don't know, I haven't looked at the terms in detail. If that's, if it's not allowed, then yes, you shouldn't be, you know, I think, <laughs> shouldn't be doing it in a production. I mean, re research I think is fine. You can, you know, you can run anything locally on your machine to try it out, but I think, I don't think this is something that will hold up. Yeah, cool. We still have time for, I believe, two questions. Who is, um, who was first? I, I believe someone from here, and then I come back to you. Cool. I think it was, oh. Well. Hi. Uh, I think he was first, but it's, it's I don't, yeah. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> we are polite, so if you were first. Sorry. <laughs> he was first. Thank you. Yeah. I wanted to ask just two questions. The first one, do you do fine tuning for your specific cases to make uh, large models more specific? And the second, do you use some frameworks like uh, Lang uh, Chain or Haystack? Um, so we haven't really d um, experimented that much with the fine tuning, but that's also, that is an option um, as well, even though it's still, you know, you still end up with this large model, but I think distillation, fine tuning, there's a lot of potential to, um, cut out all the stuff you don't need and make it more specific. And I think in the, some of the newer experiments we're running that I haven't shown here, we, are, we were using Langchain and Minichain, which I think is a more compact um, uh, version um, uh, for the prompt management. And also there's all this stuff, this boilerplate around making API calls. And um, that's always great to, <laughs> to have someone else solve. Um, and so I think, especially for the stuff we're doing with Spacey, Spacey has this config system that makes it very easy to plug in your own functions. Um, and that also means that, yeah, you can pretty much sub in any library, try it out and use it as part of the workflow and the output will still be the same. Thank you. Cool. And our last question. Oh, ah, cool. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> then are you still up to go? Cool. Yeah, thanks for the talk. Uh, you mentioned the problems in general with these models uh, with inconsistency of the output and the randomness, I think, and also the not clear format. Yeah. Did you find uh, any like good recipes to channelize this in a way to say, like to decorate your request always with a certain like surrounding, either with a system instruction or like say, independent of the question, always answer please and listen that you can always like independent of your request, wrap around, like decorate your request with a certain prompt that guarantees you or like mit mitigates this issue. Um, yeah, I think so we've, we've definitely tried out with different, so we had these, have these prompt templates basically where, okay, you can play around with different ways of phrasing it, then it subs in the text that comes in and then it has like a corresponding function that takes the response and then passes it like if it's a bullet point list. So there is some of that, but there's still, there, is, there are still cases where we just kind of have to discard what comes in. Like, for, like there's somewhere, okay, it just, it just happens. Sometimes it mentions all instances, sometimes it doesn't. Um, sometimes what comes out does not map to the original text, which can still happen. And then we're just like, man, that, the good thing in this curation workflow, you could just skip. Like if you have enough coming in, you can skip. But I do think over time there will probably, I hope that there will be more kind of best practices around this. Also as the models change, I, at least it seems reasonable. Yeah. Thank you so much.
I believe now we are out of time for the questions. <laughs> so thank you so much for being so responsive. I'll, I'll still be around. I have stickers. Um. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs>